service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with steadfast hope. Good afternoon, church. Oh, that was not bad, but uh, our numbers are down a little bit here on Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock here at West Guilford Baptist Church as we have our first of two week weekend services. This is the one that we uh, film, videotape, and which goes on YouTube and goes on um, email. Send, we send it out to our people on Facebook. So if you're watching it that way, good morning or good Evening, whenever you're watching, good middle of the night, uh, we're glad that you could join us. Today as we come together, we come together in the name of Jesus to worship him together. Um, I'm missing my opening page there, it is right up there. So I wanted to tell you a couple of things that are coming up. Mondays, we're back to having our prayer time at 10.30 on Mondays. So anyone who would like to come and join us, we'd love to have you come and join us on uh, Mondays to worship together and to pray together as well. I think there's a sign that maybe things are opening up a little bit more in this county. Uh, Saturday, September 18th, you can put on your calendars. It'll be in our update next week. The Pregnancy Care and Family Support Center, one of our mission partners, is planning to sponsor a in-person fall fundraiser at Lakeside Church with the gospel group Rhythm and Grace. They're a 10-person family group. The Duke Tal family is the name of it, and they're going to be coming 7 p.m. It's free, but it is a fundraiser, so they hope that you will come with a check or with some paper money that you can give towards that. The sanctuary is going to be set up like ours in that you sit with the group of people that you can sit with, family members. Uh, I think it's a maximum of 150. Because of the times, they don't expect to get much more than that. But to me, that's a great sign that things are beginning to open up. Um, our CFL football league began last night, and it opened up with a number of people as well. So we are know within the next few weeks whether or not there's uh, a lot of people getting uh, COVID or if the worst is past. Uh, we're talking about watching the football game later, Jim, thanks. So those are things for you to look forward to. Put it on your calendar, September 18th. And I think that's all that I want to bring to your attention. Our call to worship today is Psalm 15. And it's a beautiful call to worship. Let me just close your eyes and listen to the word of God. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live upon your holy hill? He whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man, who despises a vile man, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oaths even when it hurts, who lends his money without usury and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. Let's talk to the Lord together. 
Father, it is so good to come into your presence together and to hear that if we strive to be men and women of integrity, men and women who speak and live the truth, that we will not be shaken, despite the fact that we know that our world is often shaken. It's often in disarray. It almost seems like it's upside down sometimes. You have promised that we will not be shaken that you will hold on to us, that you will help us through whatever times we go through, hard times, good times, and for that we thank you. Father God, we thank you that we can come into your presence today because of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is the reason we are here, that we name the name of Jesus, that we are followers of Christ, of Jesus, the Son of God. We thank you that you sent your son to earth for us. We thank you that you love the world so much that you sent your only begotten son, that whosoever believes in you, in him, shall not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you, Lord, that you sent him to be our savior. We needed a savior because we know our hearts and we know that we have sinful hearts and that we are prone to wander And we have wandered many times in our lives. And it isn't because of our faithfulness that Jesus died, but because of his faithfulness. He is the one who draws us back to himself. Father God, thank you for making us blameless in your eyes by the shedding of his blood and his sacrifice over 2,000 years ago now. Help us to live righteously and to speak the truth in love and to act with integrity in all things. Father, we thank you as well for the fact that you are the one who gives us strength when we feel weak. And many of us have felt weak during the pandemic times. And Father, we pray that you will give us uh, strength when we are in that condition, that you will give us wisdom. And we pray that, Father, you will Help us uh, to live by faith and not by sight, and certainly not by fear. We pray against these variants that are in the world. We pray that they will not be nearly as serious as some are predicting. Father, you are able to quench them, to taper them down, to take them away, and so we put it in your hands. We thank you, Father, that it appears this fall, this fall, that our children and our teachers will be returning to schools, especially in Ontario, we know that. We pray that you will prepare their hearts, that you will help the teachers and the EAs and the rest of the staff, and you will help the children to be excited about going back. Father, we pray this is the right time. We put it in your hands. We have to trust you more than anything, but you've told us to honor and respect those who you have raised up in leadership. So help us to walk in that, Father. We pray today as well for those who are uh, afflicted by these fires that are going on in northern Ontario and BC and around the world, Father. Uh, Many are having to flee their homes, are losing their homes. We pray for protection for the firefighters And we pray, Father, that you will help those who are homeless to find shelter, even if it's temporary shelter. And Father, we heard news today that our brother in the Lord, John Vassilatis, is very sick and has been taken to Peterborough. And they're suspecting meningitis. And Father, we pray in your name that you show mercy to him and Deb, that this, if it is... um, meningitis that it not be a, a serious case of it, as there is different um, cases, I guess, how serious it can be. We put them in your hands. We ask that you quell their hearts, help them as uh, it is human to feel apprehensive at this time, but may you do the supernatural and give them a peace that passes all understanding. We also pray for others we know who are not well in our midst, Peter Limburner and Rick Pyle, Brian Leon, Sue Kay, 
and others. You know them all by name, Lord, as we lift them up to you. Pray, Father, for those who are recovering or preparing for upcoming surgeries, for the lonely and depressed in our midst. If we know of some who are living alone and don't see many people, one person I spoke to this week said, this summer they have literally seen no one. They've talked to people on the phone, but Father God, uh, many of us can't relate to that, but some of us can. Be with them and help them, Father. Assure them that you are always there for them. And we do continue to pray for those who grieve, Father, those who have lost loved ones in the last year or maybe beyond, that you will help them, Father. Be their strength. So we thank you. We thank you for loving us. We pray all these things in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to worship the Lord together on the screen. Our worship package today is um, done by, he calls himself and his ministry, Reawaken Hymns. His name is Nathan Drake, and we've heard him before as he leads us in some worship. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit. Washed in his blood This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior All the day long This is my story This is my song my Savior all the day long perfect submission all is at rest I in my Savior am happy and blessed watching and waiting looking above filled with his goodness lost in his love this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long this is my story this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Be thou my My heart, none be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence.
now and always Thou and Thou only be first in my heart I, King of Heaven, my treasure of my own heart whatever befall still be my vision O ruler of meet Nathan Drake in person, you make sure you thank him for what he's done during this pandemic time in that he's recorded 50 or 60 songs and done it out of the goodness of his heart and put them so that they can be used primarily by small churches like us, where sometimes we could use a, just a, a different uh, flavor of worship, or some churches don't have anyone to lead worship at all. So what a wonderful gift that has been to the body of Christ. Well, we're going to continue in our series of A to Z characteristics of growing disciples of Christ. And I think that's all of us desire to be that, to continue to grow in our relationship with Christ and as disciples of Christ until the moment 
he takes us home. One of Jesus' most powerful statements as recorded in Scripture was his declaration in John 14, 6. You may not have it memorized, but you will recognize it. He declared this to his disciples when he is telling them that he was soon going to leave them. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This afternoon, as we continue our series on the A to Z characteristics, I want us to look at, at two, at T, at T as it stands for truthful, to be truthful, as it stands for truthfulness. I doubt if there's anyone who grows up as a child says, when I get old, I want to be known as the worst liar in the world. <laughs> there's some that may end up there, but very few are taught that by their parents. I've had my grandkids living with me, as you know, for the last year and a half. August 24th is leap off day. They leap off into their own place. Praise the Lord for that. We've enjoyed them. But, but I've heard my daughter and my son-in-law catch them in white lies. That's not true. You know, that's not what your brother said. Or he didn't start it. I happened to see that you started it. And then they talk to them, and sometimes they give them a time out because they're trying to teach them truthfulness, honesty, integrity. I met someone this week who said, you know, do you have Sunday school happening yet in your church? I said, not yet, but I hope sometime this fall, hope God will bring us some kids and some workers and that. Good, I don't want to go myself, but I want my grandkids to go because they need to learn integrity. Their character needs to be stretched. And I know church helps with that. Obviously, someone who probably went to church when they were young, and they hope that we continue to teach that. I hope so too. But it's not just our children that need to walk in truthfulness. It's e every one of us. We all need to walk in, in grace and mercy and truth. Jesus claimed to be the truth, the one and only Son of God who came from the Father, and that he came to save us from our sins. He came on mission. He was the first missionary. He came to save the world because we couldn't save ourselves. Jesus lived a life of truth when he lived in this earth. He lived a life of obedience to the Father's commands, and he spoke and taught the truth like no other. That's recorded in all four Gospels, that they were amazed at his teaching. It was like no other. No other taught the truth like he did. No other lived the truth like he did. He even prophesied that he was going to be betrayed and crucified and on the third day to rise from the dead. It's found in three of the Gospels, Matthew 20, 19, if you want to check it out. He predicted that, and it was true. It came true. What is the main sign of a true prophet of God? What they say, does it come true? It came true. Today, as we look at what it means to be growing disciples, I want us to see how we must be seekers and speakers of the truth in at least three ways. We need to be committed to seeking and obeying God's truth, Secondly, we need to speak God's truth in love and with compassion. And thirdly, we need to humbly admit that we don't always understand the totality of God's word and of his truth. And we need to walk in humility with our brothers and sisters in Christ who may differ on secondary issues. First, we need to look at seeking to obey God's truth as a sign of being a disciple of Christ. There are several signs in scriptures about what it means to be a disciple of Christ, but certainly that one of those signs is that we obey God's truth. John 8, 32 says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. If you hold to my teachings, 
you will really be my disciples. See, a lot of people claim to be disciples. In Jesus' day, the crowds followed him, and at many times, they were 5,000 plus people. But not all of them were disciples or true followers of Christ. They went and listened to him for many different reasons. They heard about him. They heard how uh, his teaching was like no other. Well, I'm going to go and listen. They weren't believers, but they were curious. Some of them heard, and they went and trying to catch him up in things. Many times the Pharisees and the Sadducees went and were amongst the crowd, and they were listening, but they weren't listening to learn. They weren't listening to grow their character or to grow in truth. They were listening to catch him up and to be able to accuse him of blasphemy or to accuse him of being a false prophet. So many people can go and claim that they are disciples of Christ, but the word of God says that they will know you are a disciple by the fact that you hold to his teaching. The word hold there means you cling to his teaching. That what he teaches you don't give up the truth of that easily. You don't give it up because the culture is changing and well, if it's changing, I might as well go with the flow. The flow has never been God's way. He says that we need to follow the narrow road. And that means not being narrow-minded the world loves to use that about Christians. It means being biblical-minded and following the word of God. We need to strive to live according to Jesus' teachings and his commands, to grow our character, to be like his character, to have integrity as he had integrity. Now, none of us will ever be totally like Jesus in this earth. He was perfect. He was without sin. But we are told that we are to be more and more like him as we grow. Frederick William Robertson, well-known name here, was a well-known pastor in Brighton, England in the mid-1800s. He was known as a very good preacher of the gospel. But above all, he was known as a sincere seeker of truth and as a genuine disciple of Christ. He wrote this in his memoirs. Truth lies in character. Christ did not simply speak the truth. He was the truth. Truth through and through. For the truth is not just words, but it is a way of life and being. I want to be the truth like Jesus was the truth. It's good to have that desire to be more and more like Jesus. Many who attend this church or have lived in Halliburton County for a while know the name George Budd and his wife Beth Budd. George is my longest Christian friend and has been my, dis uh, I felt that he's been my mentor for 42 years. I met him when I was 24 years of age and he has had a wonderful uh, ministry of encouragement to people and of spiritual disciplines to people. He's had retreats. He's held spiritual conferences, many of them in Halliburton County, most of them probably at Lakeside Church. And pe person after person, after they've met and talked with George and with Beth, said, boy, they really love the Lord, don't they? You just see it in their eyes. You hear it in their voice. You hear it in their compassion towards other people. He's an Old Testament Bible scholar who really knows his New Testament uh, as well. But what I believe he's known to many people as is a gentle, encouraging child of God, fellow traveler on the Lord. He has two master's degrees, so he's well-educated, but he never comes across that way. He comes across as someone who genuinely cares for you, loves you, and accepts you. When I grow up, I want to be like George because I see Jesus in George. And though he's now 75 and has Parkinson and can't minister the way he uh, used to, when I talk to him on the phone, that same 
truth and that same compassion, that same Christ-likeness comes out. I long to talk to him because I miss him. He can't come this way very often, and I don't get down that way very often. In other words, George's character looks like Jesus. And I think we all need to strive to be like Jesus. Ephesians 4.15 leads us into our second point, And it tells us that we are to be speaking the truth in love to each other. To speak the truth in love to each other. Now, there's a lot of people in this world, some you may know, who love to speak hard truth to people. They just can't wait to give them a piece of their mind. You know, ah, oh, they're really wrong. The waiter, I get a hold of them. I'll talk to them. I'll set them straight. And yet, very seldom does that turn out very good. If your attitude is, I have the truth, and they don't, and I'm going to shove it down their throat, you're not very successful that way. We need to speak the truth in love. We need to remember that telling people the truth when they differ with us, we don't need to convince them. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. We just need to speak the truth in love. We need to speak it with a heart of love and care towards them. A caring heart goes a long way. And if we don't have a caring heart, if people don't know that we care for them, they don't care what you believe or what you know or what you consider truth. They want to know you care for them. Much more important. This coming week, I'm, Lord willing, going to meet with a 19-year-old girl and her grandmother. 19-year-old is struggling that her mother is struggling with alcoholism and can't beat it. And told her grandmother, I need to speak to someone, I'm going crazy. Her grandmother, who I've never, never attended my church, but I know from the community as a Christian woman, phoned me up and said, I heard along the way that you had family members who were alcoholics. I said, my mother died when I was 39 of alcoholism. Yeah, I've, I've seen it. My grandfather at 53, I was going that way when I came to Christ. She said, I'm going to pass that on to my granddaughter. When the granddaughter heard that, she said, I want to see him because he understands. He understands what it's like to have that. When I meet with her, I'm not going to speak against her mother, who I know, who I know is a fine woman, a woman who has a big heart, because we all have areas we struggle in, right? None of us are perfect. We all have areas that perhaps we're addicted to or we fall short of the glory of God in time and time again. We need to, when we speak to people, we need to speak in love. I've already prayed and said, Lord, if you bring us together, help me to show your compassion and love towards her mother, towards her, towards the situation. It is a hard situation. I've had many people in similar situations say, yeah, but it's their fault. They didn't have to take the first drink. Maybe that's true. Person who has problems because they're overweight, I don't hear many people say often, yeah, but it's their fault, they're overweight, but some do. I have heard some say that, Pastor, if you had lost 30 pounds, you'd be a lot quicker on your feet. That'd be true. But it's not that easy for everyone. Well, I know someone who did. It's not impossible, but it's not that easy for everyone. We need to make sure that we speak to people with love flowing out of us, that they sense and feel that we care for them, that we are not judging them. We need to say, Lord, help me to, when I speak to people, to speak out of conviction, but not trying to convict them of sin. Out of conviction, but not trying to convict them. Help me to speak to them with a loving voice, not shouting at them or calling them names or with a sense that we're disappointed or angry or that we're better than them. That's not speaking the truth in love. We all need to learn and grow in this area to keep uh, knowing that God uses us more when we are uh, gentle in spirit. Proverbs 15, 13 says, a gentle spirit turns away wrath. 
You want to be able to have a good conversation with someone? Speak gently to them. Don't yell at them. It's been a long journey for me in that. Hopefully, Lord knows, but I think in the last 10 years, I've become better at that with my family. French-Canadian, that's what I use as an excuse, would blow up easily early in my marriage or with my kids. I think one of the greatest gifts Laura, our buddy, was to our family was that I had to grow in patience or go crazy. <laughs> Sometimes God puts us in a situation where either we grow or we split up relationships, we split up families. So we need to say, Lord, help me to speak the truth to others in love. Help me to preach that as I'm a preacher. Help you to live that when you come in contact with people. Yes, we need to challenge them with the truth at times, not just because we want to, but if God shows us, you know, you know them well, maybe you should go and have a talk with them. We need to speak to them gently and in love. Matthew 18, verse 15 to 17, is a well-known passage that is um, kind of well-known for uh, an example of how you're to confront and love some people who maybe have sinned against you personally. This is what it says. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you've won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them as well, then you need to tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now we automatically at that part goes, oh, we're to shun him. Well, did Jesus do that? What did Jesus do with pagans, non-believers? He told them the truth about God's love. What did Jesus do with tax collectors? At times, he hung out with them. He invited one of them to be one of his 12 disciples. He didn't treat them badly. We need to remember that. But this passage, read it over and over. There's no hint that Jesus yelled at them or condemned them in any way. Galatians 6.1 says, Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual, spiritual should restore him gently. Gently. That's with care and compassion and with love. We are not to do it with judgment. Jesus never chose to hammer the truth into people. Instead, he trusted the Holy Spirit to use his words and the word of God the Father to draw them to himself and to the Father. It seems that many today seem to think that that's not the way for today, for that you got to speak harshly or loudly. There are several conspiracy theory pastors out there that I've watched a little bit of what they say, sometimes whole sermons, but I find it very hard to watch some of them because they are angry. They were mad. They are calling names to Christians who think differently. They are calling other pastors who have decided not to close their churches or open them totally, mask-free, vaccine-free. You don't need any of that, whether you believe you do or not. They are calling them out with all kinds of anger and and people are clapping and saying, you tell them, you tell them. They sound more like a mob to my heart than they sound like men and women of God who love one another. There are lots of things that you may differ with someone else about, but you're to do it in love, in concern. The end times, there are people who believe that Jesus is coming back tomorrow, and others who believe, oh, we're just at the beginning, it will be years and some who, uh, they disagree with each other. And so because they don't agree, they don't fellowship. They can't talk to each other. We need to talk to each other. But more than that, we need to love one another. Thirdly, as disciples of Christ, we need to humbly admit 
that we do not have the market on understanding God's truth all the time. Say that again. We don't have the market on God's truth all the time. No matter how well read you are, no matter how well studied you are, you do not know God's truth the way he knows God's truth. Only God, only Jesus, God's son, understands 100% of the time the truth of every situation, of every uh, thing that's in the Bible. Only Jesus understands that the word of God can be applied, only he can apply it perfectly. This pastor can't. There have been times when I'm sure that I've gotten the application maybe a little off-center, maybe totally wrong, because I am human. I try very hard to apply it accurately according to the word of God, but only God can do that. Only Jesus can do that. He always declared the word of God and applied it perfectly. That doesn't mean that we should ever change our view on God's word because of other people. We should never change our opinion because of our culture. But we need to be humble enough to admit, hey, I don't know everything. Many times people have asked me hard questions and say, I'm not sure on that. I remember that passage and I, boy, I struggle with that too. It's hard to admit that, but that's the truth. None of us understand it the way God understands it. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says this, now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Paul is writing there saying, there will be the day when I will understand things fully. My mind will see things exactly the way God sees them, but not now. It's dim in many areas for many of us. I've studied the Word of God for 35 years, and I still feel very much like a novice. Very much, much of the time. We need to do the best to show ourselves to be approved, as we've looked at before, but we need to have that humility. Good, conservative, biblical scholars have different viewpoints on things like the rapture, the end times, women in ministry, uh, baptism, the mode of baptism. We're Baptists here, but there are good people who love the Lord who see a different mode of baptism as being the way it should go. We need to say, well, I don't see eye to eye with you on that, but I still love you as a brother or sister in Christ. We need to agree to disagree in love on things that are not major gospel issues in the word of God. We need to be seekers of truth. We need to obey the truth that God reveals to us. We need to speak the truth in love, full of compassion towards others. And we need to ask the Lord, Lord, make me humble. Don't, I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to know everything. Help us to have the attitude that only God knows everything. And if on this Whatever you're discussing with this person, we disagree, as the word of God says, then commit it unto God. Commit it unto God. Speak the truth in love. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are the God of truth, that we can trust your word on all things. And you have told us that you want us to live lives of integrity, to seek after the truth and to strive to live it the best we can. But that doesn't mean that we think we need to think that we know everything about everything or that we're better than those who think differently on some issues. Help us, Lord, to be humble. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, your word says, and you will lift us up. So we admit sometimes we need humbling. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to... Sing one last song together, asking the Lord to help find us faithful.
Oh, may all who come 